Very good. Well, I would like to say uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here and being present for our first virtual Dimensions of Sustainability Symposium. I'm Reinmar Zeidler, lecturer in conservation biology and sustainability science at UMass Boston and curator for the last eight years of the Sustainability Symposia. UMass Bo Boston Biology Department has been producing these biannual events since uh, 2012. So this is, I believe, the 15th edition. We've looked at a wide range of aspects of sustainability. Um, many of the symposia have focused uh, on climate change and of course, many on biodiversity, uh, but none yet has focused on public health. So this is a first. COVID has obviously had um, you know, extensive impacts on people's lives really all over the globe. But what about on biodiversity? more specifically on the conservation and the protection of biodiversity. Lockdowns have artificially and temporarily reduced the human footprint on the natural world. Some of the impacts have been readily visible, but they've also limited research activities and monitoring programs. So some of the impacts have, have not been so re readily uh, uh, perceptible. Guest speakers today are all well-placed to observe and document some of these impacts that COVID has had on, uh, on conservation and on biodiversity. And, uh, and they're well-placed to draw conclusions and some lessons from the coronavirus experience. So I am very much looking forward to what our honored four guests have to say. And I will introduce each speaker briefly before they speak and uh, I hope they'll expand upon my brief remarks in their presentations. Audiences always are interested in the person behind the research, as it were. Um, presentations will be about 20 minutes apiece. No, they'll be exactly 20 minutes apiece. And we will note down our questions as audience members and save them for a roundtable discussion at the end. So if we stick, stick to this timetable, we should be finished by shortly after seven o'clock. I'm aware, thing, I'm aware that, um, that creeping Zoom fatigue is a common secondary public health concern brought on by COVID-19. As always, our uh, greatest thanks, deepest thanks go to the biology department for their support and facilitation, especially Sarah Yelamati on this particular occasion. Uh, since their inception, the Dimensions of Sustainability Symposia have been made possible by the Ruth and Fuad Safwat Enhancement Fund at the biology department. And we're very grateful for their support and generosity over the years. Uh, the symposium is held especially in honor and in memory of Dr. Fuad Safwat. And I've asked Dr. Bawa to say a few preliminary words about Fuad before we start. Dr. Bawa. Uh, thank you. Reinmar, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, as Reinmar mentioned, the symposia on dimensions of sustainability, which we have been having every year, twice, have been supported by Ruth Bennett and Fuad Safwat Enhancement Funds. Both Ruth Bennett and Fuad Safwat were former uh, faculty members of the biology department. Sadly, uh, Fuad Safwat uh, passed away a few months ago, uh, but Ruth is here today uh, listening to the speakers uh, and, uh, and we, are, we are happy to have her here among us. And I just wanted to say a few words about Fuad. Uh, he was a colleague of mine uh, when I joined the department. Uh, he was, uh, he had just left uh, uh, as, a, as a chair of the department. Uh, and I was just so delighted to, to meet him. Uh, he was one of the very, very few faculty members who really impressed me uh, greatly just during the first two minutes of our meeting. And, uh, uh, and I immediately said to myself, I'd like to know him more. 
I certainly would like to join the department if a person like Quad Safwat is there. And I'm very happy that uh, I did join the department and uh, spent uh, several years uh, with uh, Quad Safwat. He was an accomplished biologist uh, and a very able administrator. He served as the chairman of the biology department, uh, as, a, as a dean of graduate studies, uh, and as a provost. I think one thing I want to say about Fouad is he really cared for others. It seems sometimes the sole mission in his life was to help his colleagues and the university to enable them to do their best. And I think today's seminar is also about caring for others, caring for all life on earth. And I think Ford would have really appreciated today's theme and what our speakers have to say. Uh, Ford will be missed, uh, but he will be always in our hearts and minds and welcome all. Uh, especially our distinguished panelists, and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bauer. And um, with that, we would like to jump right in. And uh, um, Dr. Um, Dr. Richard Primack is our first speaker, who will give a sort of an overview of some of the concerns and issues that uh, we'll then explore. Uh, in some depth. Um, uh, Dr. Richard Primack is professor of biology at Boston University, where he and his lab have focused for a number of years on phenology, uh, specifically how climate change is affecting the flowering and fruiting times of plants, as well as the migration time of birds and flight times of insects. Um, and one major concern with uh, biodiversity and climate change has been that the timing of these events um, it can create the potential for ecological mismatches between species and their resources. So um, Dr. Primack's work makes it possible to add significant detail to the predictive modeling of future climate change impacts, which are still pretty uh, crude instruments at this, at this time. Um, Dr. Primack has been working mostly quite close to home in Massachusetts, especially in Concord, Mass, because that's where the philosopher and naturalist Henry David Thoreau lived and kept notebooks recording many types of phenological events over most of his adult life. Very, very interesting historical re uh, resource uh, for conservation and for biology. And, uh, and this work has helped to stimulate um, a widespread renewed interest in using unpublished historical data sets, which is a kind of historical citizen science. So Dr. Primack, what do you have to say about COVID-19 and conservation biology? Okay, let's see, can you, can you see my screen now? We see you on your screen at the moment. Okay, okay. There we go. Okay, great. Okay, um, well, Thank you for that introduction. Um, do I actually note that that introduction probably could have almost served as well for one of the later speakers, Abe Miller Rushing, um, who worked on all the Concord and Thoreau data with me. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this symposium today. Um, it's a great honor to be here. These uh, symposia are well known in the Boston area. I'm going to introduce the subject today to you of the ecological, and uh, conservation impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown. And I'll introduce a number of themes, which I think the later speakers will then later elaborate on. So uh, this event has come on us quite suddenly and uh, many of us have shifted our research to the ecological and conservation effects of the pandemic. So the pandemic is, is undoubtedly a tremendous tragedy um, this is a tragedy, both as a public health tragedy, but also it has, we're, we're in the middle of an educational crisis caused by the pandemic. It's also an economic crisis as many people are out of their jobs. Um, it is a 
political crisis that we're in because of the election and, and dealing with this event. And so there are many implications of it. It's also a social justice crisis because of its disproportionate impacts on certain members of the community. But this pandemic is also an opportunity. We're living through one of the greatest alterations in human activity, which has occurred within my lifetime or certainly since the post World War II period. And this represents an incredible opportunity for ecologists, conservation biologists, environmental scientists to see what is working and what isn't working with our conservation, environmental and ecological efforts. We can view this uh, pandemic lockdown as an anthropos, a chance to see what happens when we dramatically alter the level of human activity. How does this impact the systems that we're studying? We can also consider this as a global human confinement experiment. So because of this, um, a number of us, including Amanda Bates, who will be speaking later on, and Carlos Duarte, and many other people, have formed an organization called Pan Environment, which attempts to look at the environmental impacts of the pandemic lockdown. And in a preliminary paper that we published several months ago, we began to look at all the threats to biological diversity and then its potential impacts on different elements of, of, the, of biological diversity. So all the different levels, types of human activities and how they impact biological diversity. So we started off with this very simple uh, diagram shown here and we've been starting to fill it in um, over the last several months. And I think that Amanda Bates, when she gives her presentation, might give you more details on this. So in my talk today, I'm going to be talking about how the pandemic and the lockdown affects three basic aspects of, of biodiversity. First, biodiversity itself, just the, the direct impacts on, on all aspects of nature, but also how the pandemic impact affects conservation management and this is something that I think that um, Abe Miller Rushing will talk more about in his talk. And then also um, impacts on research, um, education and training, which is something that I think that Teresa Crimmins will speak more about in her talk. But just to give an example of, of one of the early indications that we had of the impacts of the pandemic was that in Eastern China or East Asia, uh, mostly in China, uh, this is an area which is notorious for its high levels of air pollution I've shown on the left, and forgive me if the scale is not very readily, but I'll tell you that the highly colored area is the most the area with the most air pollution. And you can see that before the pandemic, there was very heavy air pollution um, in much of Northern China, especially. Um, but in the days and weeks following the pandemic, um, this, this, this air pollution largely disappeared because there was just such a decline in human activity. And several billion people were confined during the height of the pandemic to their homes with a resulting just tremendous decline in, in uh, vehicular traffic, um, smoke or air pollution from, from factories and decline in shipping traffic. So huge impacts on, um, on human activity. Um, so the, the pandemic, the pandemic and the lockdown results in, in an opportunity to see how human activity affects wildlife and, and other aspects of biological diversity. And so in one of the early papers on this subject by Menenti and colleagues, they described how the pandemic would be affecting many different aspects of wildlife. So in particular, as people were less active that wildlife might start appearing more frequently and, and wildlife might expand its level of activity, um, its, its range of activity and, the, the distribution of species. So we might be seeing positive effects of less human activity, and this would allow us to have a better appreciation of to what extent wildlife was afraid of people. There might also be some bad activities. So for example, there might be some increase of non-native species or invasive species, but there might also be some uh, ugly activities of, of the lockdown, which is greater opportunities for people to be illegally killing wildlife, for example, illegally hunting wildlife in ways that they hadn't been doing in the past. And many reports have come out now about changes in wildlife associated with changes in human behavior. And many of these reports are starting to be published now. Um, we also have a colleague, um, Christian Rutz from the United Kingdom, and he's one of the leaders of the, the Biologging Society. 
And the biologgers have been just been increasingly focused on more advanced technology for studying the movements of animals. And now the pandemic has given them renewed energy and enthusiasm for studying the impacts of, or to studying wildlife using this biologging technology. So they're seeing how the species that they've been studying before, for example, species like these uh, seals or species like these um, seabirds, um, how their behavior has been changing with the with the pandemic and the lockdown. And again, they're finding that there are many unexpected changes that many species are expanding their range, they're occupying different areas that they did not occur in before. Um, again, using these biologging technologies or looking at existing studies and then expanding them during the time of the lockdown. Um, one of the most interesting studies which was published several months ago uh, and which really took advantage of the opportunities provided by the pandemic was a study of white crowned sparrows um, in California. And researchers there had been studying these white, white crowned sparrows in detail to see the decibel levels of their song in areas which were very heavily impacted by road traffic in the San Francisco area. And when the pandemic lockdown occurred, these researchers Im immediately realized that they could be restudying these uh, sparrows. And they found that once the lockdown occurred and these areas became much quieter because of less vehicular traffic, that these white crowned sparrows started singing much more quietly, but in a much more complex way. So they didn't have to sing as loud, but they could sing sexier songs that were appreciated by other sparrows. And these quieter songs, in fact, were able to, to reach longer distances because they're of less background noise. We've also, our research group also is interested in noise pollution, and we've been studying noise pollution in many parks in the Boston area. And we find that most parks are actually quieter now because of less vehicular traffic, but actually the sound levels in the Blue Hills State Park is actually greater because the traffic is now, even though there's less traffic, the traffic is going faster and making much more noise because it's traveling, traveling at 70 miles an hour rather than at 20 miles an hour. Um, there are also um, changing management in many parks in the United States and throughout the world. And again, this is something that Abe Miller Rushing, I'm sure we'll talk about in his presentation. But if we look at um, park areas around the world, um, excuse the fact that this, excuse the fact that I just made this slide this afternoon and the scales didn't come out, but the upper part of this map here shows the distribution of intense biologging studies. And you can see that biologging studies tend to be concentrated in North Africa and, excuse me, North America and, and Europe. And, but the bottom graph, which is really what I wanna direct your attention to, shows you where there have been changes in park visitation um, in different areas of the world. And the areas shown in red are areas where there's been a marked decrease in the number of people coming into national parks. And so you can see that in throughout most of South America and also in France and Spain, much of India, that the level of people visiting national parks has declined dramatically. Also note that in Southern Africa, the number of people visiting national parks has declined substantially. But in other areas of the world, primarily in North America and in Northern Europe, the number of people coming to national parks has increased quite substantially. Um, on this, uh, in the figure here, you can see very, very intense uh, visitation in a national park where people are just really right on top of these animals. And in many of these parks in the developing world, the number of people in these parks has declined very substantially. Um, with this decline in tourism in many areas of the world, uh, this has had tremendous consequences for park management. It means that in many areas of the world, there's been a dramatic drop off in park revenues because these parks depend on tourists coming from uh, overseas to contribute money to the running of the park, a decline in park activities without park revenue, park rangers can't be hired to uh, come into the park, a decline in all aspects of park employment. So all the people who used to manage the uh, uh, facilities for the tourists, all the hotels and restaurants have no more employment and all the surrounding employment in the surrounding community, again, all the hotels, restaurants, vehicles, souvenir stands, suddenly people have no employment. And this has consequences to the running of the park and to the management of the park. 
So with a loss of revenue in these parks, there's often been a, a lack of enforcement to run ranger patrols and to provide enforcement. And in many of these report, in many of these parks throughout the world, there are increasing reports of poaching, um, so illegal hunting, illegal logging, clearing of protected areas, um, uncontrolled fires throughout the world. And we're starting to see reports of this in the media and also increasingly articles describing this in detail, both before and after studies now being submitted to the peer review literature. An example is in India. So in many areas of India, there, there are reports of the density of wildlife and the effectiveness of ranger patrols in maintaining uh, the wildlife in parks in India. And in many of these areas now, there's increased people in rural areas as they've lost their jobs in the cities. And also a lack of enforcement um, of ranger patrols. And as a result, there's increasing hunting of animals. So for example, increased um, hunting of pangolins um, and then selling of pangolins into the international illegal wildlife trade. Or in Brazil, for example, we have this combination of the lack of enforcement in rural areas of Brazil and also the government withdrawing the enforcement as it focuses on controlling the pandemic and also not really enforcing wildlife regulations in rural areas because it, the government feels that local people should have the right to sort of gain livelihood by hunting, by logging, and by burning the forest just to survive during the time of the pandemic. So we see tremendous environmental consequences. Uh, just one local example, um, in Newton, Massachusetts, um, I grew up next to the Webster Woods um, in Newton, which is actually the, the, the woods that you go to on the Riverside line between uh, Chestnut Hill and Newton Center. Um, this shows the green line right here. And uh, this is a woods which I've studied for my whole life. And the area shown in blue here are the areas of old trails which were there prior to 1972. Uh, the reddish purple trails are the trails that, that so-called new trails that were made between 1972 and the year 2020 in February. And the area shown in reddish orange on this map are trails which were made in April, March, April, and May of this year. And you can see this remarkable increase of new trails made over the first several months of the pandemic. So this right here, for example, is a new trail uh, that would, didn't, wasn't in existence and was made by people cutting through on foot and then mountain bikes coming in into this area and making this completely new trail in the woods, which only formed during this time period. The amazing thing about this uh, map here is that the number of new trails made in the first two months of the pandemic was this almost exactly the same length of new trails which had been made in these woods between 1972 and, nine, and 2020. So in 48 years, the number of new trails was almost the same as the number of trails made in the two and a half months, the first two and a half months of the pandemic. So one of the consequences of the pandemic, again, as I mentioned, is reduced management. And we're just now really seeing what the effects are on this lack of management in national parks. And again, this is something that I think that Abe will tell us more about in US national parks. But for example, um, in the Everglades has been a great effort to control um, invasive animals like pythons. Um, these animals were, were uh, getting under control. And then with a lack of management during this year of the pandemic, will these invasive animals start increase, increasing in abundance at the present time to the point where they're difficult to control? Or efforts to reduce invasive plants, you know, what will be the impacts of the pandemic on our ability to control invasive plants? And similarly, with, with efforts to establish, uh, to restore habitat, or efforts to manage um, endangered wildlife in national parks, what will be the impacts of this pandemic and the lack of management during this time? I also want to sort of uh, also mention briefly the impacts of the pandemic on, on research and training. Um, so this third area that I'll talk about is something which um, is really has huge consequences and people are really haven't focused on this very much. A lot of emphasis on, on management and on wildlife, but not so much on the human consequences to the ecological and conservation community. So for example, many researchers, graduate students, um, undergraduates, their research is being modified 
or in many cases canceled. And we really don't know what the consequences of that are for people when their research is canceled or has to be modified. So for example, as a specific example, I do research in Concord, as Ryan Mar mentioned. And in the, in the past, I always brought large groups of students to come out with me to help me do the monitoring and also to teach them how to identify plants. And I haven't been able to do this that this year. I've just gone out on my own, heavily masked, and done the research by myself. And I have many colleagues in my department who depend on going out every summer on research vessels to gather their data in marine biology, and their expeditions have been canceled this year with just severe consequences for graduate students and undergraduates. Um, just an example of what the possibilities are, that there's this network called the LTER sites, the Long-Term Ecological Research Sites, which monitor the environment for ecosystem processes throughout the United States. And these sites have all been more or less shut down over the summer. And what are really the, what are the implications of this for this long-term monitoring, monitoring network? They have some um, automated equipment running, but will this automated equipment really be able to tell us the ecological impacts of, of the pandemic? And that's something that we're waiting for. One of the things which is really of great consequence is what are the, what are the implications of the pandemic on the young ecological and conservation community? So undergraduates like the ones shown here or um, interns shown here, they, are, they depend on, on this experience of working with researchers during the semester and over the summer during breaks to gain experience to earn income, to get their first job, and really what is the implications of this pandemic on this, this experience, this lack of experience, this cancel, cancellation of experiences to um, undergraduates. I mean, also is the experience that, that they are having online, or for example, even the experience that you are having online now in the Zoom symposium, is this really effective? Are the people who are learning conservation courses, ecological courses online, are they really getting enough out of it? And if they're doing research online, is this really going to train them to go on and become effective professionals in the field? And this is something that we don't know that we need to study and that really needs to be addressed. So what is the impact of the pandemic on PhD programs, on internships and employment? Is this really something which is going to be adequate? Also, another consequence is what is the effect of the pandemic on meetings? So instead of having these meetings online, these large meetings like the Ecological Society of America, will they really be adequate when they're taught, when they're presented online as happened over this past summer? Or similarly, when people get together in small workshops, instead of getting together in small workshops in person, can they be effective in small groups? This is something that we're learning about. And also one of the things that many people are addressing is real, realizing that these effects of the pandemic disproportionately impact certain groups within the ecological and conservation community, especially women, women with young children, um, minorities within American society, and also economically disadvantaged groups. So these groups will be disproportionately affected by the pandemic and the pandemic lockdown, and that people are starting to think about special considerations that these groups need to be able to continue to function within the ecological and, and, and conservation communities during this time of the lockdown. And then one thing which I, as an editor, am very interested in is, what is the impact of, on publications of the pandemic? What happens when, when research studies are missing a year or can't really complete their studies because of the pandemic? Is the studies real, are the studies really going to be published? Can they be published in an incomplete form? Or are they really just, is everything going to have to be delayed by one or two years as people fill in this missing, missing project? And so in conclusion, I think that there's a lot of opportunities for things that we can learn from the pandemic. So undoubtedly, this is a tragedy, but there are things which we can learn from the pandemic. Uh, there are things, there are new insights that we can get on ecological and conservation systems that we couldn't get any other way. So we can address, for example, is, is the management that we're presently applying really needed? And what happens if we no longer have that, have that management in effect.
And again, just emphasizing that this, that this pandemic is a tragedy. So it's, it's an economic tragedy, it's a public health tragedy, an education tragedy. And this is one of the most important events in the last uh, 60 years, the last 80 years. Uh, there is really no event like this in my lifetime that really compares to this in terms of its disruption of human society. So it's a tragedy, but it's an, also an opportunity to observe and to learn. And with that, I end my talk and thank you very much. I think you're muted, Ryan Mark. You are right. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, awesome introduction and uh, covering um, a lot of the bases and uh, preparing um, us for the uh, next um, next speakers. And uh, so thank you so much. Um, for the audience, I just wanted to mention, uh, should have mentioned before, that um, we have a Q&A function, um, sort of like a chat function um, with through which you can ask questions. We'll address them at the round table after all of the speakers have uh, have have spoken. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Amanda Bates, um, who's associate professor at the Canada Research and Canada Research Chair in Marine Physiolog Physiological Ecology at the Memorial University in Newfoundland. And um, uh, Dr. Bates has extremely broad interests and expertise, ranging from seabirds to sea urchins and more and back again. Um, she's particularly working on the physiological and ecological impacts of temperature changes in marine environments, something both difficult to study and very important to study. Um, and uh, I'd noticed on her Google Scholar um, page that she's got at least four or five articles published this year on the impact of coronavirus pandemic on research and conservation with a particular focus on, on marine issues, but not an exclusive focus on marine issues, interestingly. So very much looking forward to hearing um, Dr. B uh, Bates' uh, comments. Amanda. I'm just gonna get my screen share up here. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Great. Coming through. Great. Um, so I thank you very much for the kind introduction, Raymar, and also for inviting me to be a part of this symposium. It's very exciting. Um, and I guess I'll first start off by just highlighting that I am a marine physiologist, but I also work on conservation biology and a huge number of topics because I think I'm mostly driven by curiosity. And just like all of us, when COVID hit, I could look forward and see that there was going to be this incredible lockdown. And I thought, wow, I'm going to honestly be very depressed and like kind of get into a hole or I can focus my mental energy on something that is going to feed back into the system. And I guess um, Richard Primick, um, who just introduced, was a bit of a kind of intellectual partner for me in this because we work together, together as editors at Biological Conservation. And it was really this group of editors that kind of motivated us when you know, I was sitting facing homeschooling and having my kids at home, but, but, but because I was with this group of motivated people, we started writing about COVID and the pandemic. And I got really fascinated with this idea of if we had set this up as a global experiment, imagine what we could do if we actually had a global observing system and it was in place, we could have learned so much but there is a lot of global observing systems that are in place. And from those, we're gaining a lot of information. And so one of the things I work on in my, my I guess maybe 20% of my program is really on global observing and trying to kind of amass global observations. So thinking about this a little bit, I also am really fascinated by this shared experience. And no matter who you talk to on the planet right now, there is this shared experience of what's happened during this pandemic and it's manifested very differently in different places, but you can even share it, see it in the shared humor um, and some of the kind of jokes that are coming out. You can almost spin the world around and change these captions. And yes, they're in English, but you could translate them and they would be relevant to many other places in the world if you kind of spin the globe around. 
So I think it's this shared experience that is very, very powerful. And there will always be this shared experience of this pandemic that is here in our society now. Um, the children of the pandemic. Oh, I did my PhD in the pandemic. I mean, I can't wait until this is over and I'm sure everyone will be celebrating New Year's with me. It's like, yay, 2020 and hopefully 2021 will be a little easier for us. So this shared experience is a pretty amazing time to reflect and also to kind of harness what we know about the world and then move forward. And I think it's that uh, momentum that really drove um, Dr. Primick, as well as uh, Carlos Duarte. And we kind of got together initially and were inspired by trying to understand what we could gain that would be positive from this experience. And so I've decided to have a very positive talk today and I'm only gonna talk about positive things. Okay, so this um, little diagram Richard highlighted earlier and it kind of focuses uh, in the purple on um, changes in how human beings basically moved around the planet and aspects of human mobility. And then the orange were various threats to biodiversity from pollution to exploitation. And then the green were just ideas initially about how biodiversity would respond. And the blue were um, science enforcement and policy. And Richard's done a lovely job of highlighting all of these. And so what I'm gonna focus on today is just a little bit of, of what we know about what happened in our ocean and then how that influenced a couple of links on this diagram. And so I wanna flag that I'm really focusing in, but in the context of this huge, rich uh, diversity of stories that are emerging from this past year. It's truly incredible. And so what's um, kind of interesting about these series of lockdowns or series of anthropauses is that you know, we're, we're now almost a year in and, you know, COVID kind of emerged around this time last year, but the lockdown reached its peak in April. And so everything I'm talking about and a lot of what Richard talked about is really those months in April near the peak to, um, to May, where we were able to link a lot of responses to a lack of mobility and then use that as a baseline. And since this time, we haven't, you know, the lockdowns have been very variable. And so this was really our peak and it's probably going to be our maximum peak, hopefully. Okay. So what we decided to do was, as Richard mentioned, to kind of form a, a working group. And our working group collated 90 teams from around the world, as well as anecdotes from around the world. And it's this amazing and rich context that I think is kind of so just just really quite interesting. Um, and we've put forward a manuscript and I'm not going to talk too much about this today, but if you want to contact me about it afterwards or if you want to contact Dr. Primit, please do. Um, but what I'd like to highlight, and I know Richard mentioned this as well, <clears throat> is how much of our ocean our earth is. And when I look and I see projections of the earth, it's often the, the area of earth that's mostly covered by land. But of course, most of our earth is ocean. Most of it is unobserved. Most of it is out of sight and out of mind historically, but less so now. And so we're now entering the UN decade of the ocean where we're really focusing on our oceans and conservation in our ocean and focuses on our oceans as we increasingly move deeper and uh, we're mining in our deep ocean systems now. And I can really see a great momentum for understanding um, ocean systems. So what happened? Well, first, and I think this is truly fascinating, is um, you know the whole entire cruise ship industry collapsed. So we have this situation where cruise ships became kind of a hotbed for COVID infestation, which is quite fascinating. So we we stop our cruise ships; they're still not operating, you know, at the same kind of capacity. So these shut down. This image shows a roots of shipping maps around the world, and what's really remarkable. Um, I actually put the link here if anyone wants to go to this afterwards because there's animations of shipping throughout the world and they're just fascinating to watch. But they, this is the shipping maps. There are, land has not been drawn onto these maps. These land masses are actually highlighted by shipping routes. So that's how much of our waterways that we're using for shipping is we can truly outline our coastlines just by where these routes are. <clears throat> 
And as consequence of COVID, a lot of these routes um, shut down. We reduced kind of supply and transport chains around the globe. So we had uh, a decrease in shipping globally, especially during the peak uh, of the lockdown. And this image here is just something I grabbed um, from uh, the internet. There's a, there's a link for where this information is from if anyone's interested. But basically this is historical data that dates back um, a decade and shows that in the period in which uh, we have our lockdown, there was, there was the dip. And so, you know, with this historical data and data on shipping, because of course we have information on this, we see this kind of impact in our, in our waterways. And another, um, we do have the capacity to observe fishing vessels because we have automated vessel detection devices on fishing vessels. Now, let's imagine that all of these work perfectly and were used perfectly during this COVID period. So we have accurate information. If we uh, take this information and look at what happened with uh, fishing fleets, this is based on global fishing watch data. And so this is again using a automated kind of capacity is overall across 14 different fishing fleets, there was an 11% decline. So an 11% decline for two months, it actually equates to a lot of fish. I haven't converted it to biomass, but it would be huge. So there could be implications for this, although it was very variable across different fisheries. So I've shown some of this variability here where we have gill nets, persanes, drifting long lines that range from a drop of 13 to 5%, for instance. So a lot of variability, but overall there was less fish, at least for a short period of time that was removed from the ocean. And if we look kind of overall and combine all of the automated uh, vessel detection devices across you know, shipping and different um, commercial as well as industrial applications, this is an example from the Americas. But overall uh, for North and South America, and here's um, the average from different countries, in some places there was a, you know, a huge decline in overall uh, vessel use on the ocean. So for instance, in St. Lucia, it's you know, almost a negative, a drop of 50% basis ba versus the historical baseline. So a huge drop in vessel traffic. Now, what's really fascinating about this is that there has been decades of research that are highlighting the potential impacts of sound on ocean organisms because sound carries so dramatically in the ocean and so many uh, animals in the ocean use uh, sound and pressure to communicate. So now we have a situation where we can actually look at sound and how that may have influenced life if there was the capacity to measure it in the first place. And so this is uh, from Vancouver. And I used to kayak across here almost every day 20 years ago. So let's assume it was less impacted then. And I never saw anything but maybe an eagle and a seal. So these, uh, there have been this remarkable um, documentation of animals, especially charismatic fauna, in areas where they're not normally seen. And this is attributed to a decrease in sound. And this particular example comes from Vancouver, where there is an observatory, it's Oceans Network Canada, and there was a hydrophone in place that was being monitored in blue, and then a drop in sound in this area, during which there were observations of marine mammals. And so this really highlights the importance of observatories that are in place that are often so hard to find funding for and just take so much energy and kind of fighting for funds, especially in the ocean because of the infrastructure needs and the challenges of moder monitoring in an ocean, a very dynamic system. And so this is the Strait of Georgia. It's north of Seattle. It's uh, Vancouver is here. And this observatory has um, capacity on the ferries as well as a fiber optic um, cable observatory that go under the seafloor. And so from this entire system, because there was observations in place and because there were hydrophones in place, 
they were able to observe a real decrease in uh, sound in that area. And so it was um, a decrease of 81%, which is quite, quite large. Okay, so what this really is striking to me thinking about this and having processed it for a few months is what this has allowed us to do is to look at how human beings and these kind of small local effects kind of combine and um, accumulate to potentially have some larger impacts. And these are some of the things that we haven't been able to observe before. And so it's these sightings of these animals and it's being attributed to sound, but the, the interesting part of all of this is that of course it wasn't able to be detected prior to this. And for the last decade, there's been an amazing network. Uh, it's an international quiet ocean experiment. And this experiment is uh, colleagues who have been uh, working with scientists who have deployed hydrophones. And the aim was to have uh, a time period where different regions would just shut down. So you could have a quiet ocean even for a half of a day. And that was even a challenge to achieve. And so this group was ready. They had their network, they have hydrophones, and I can't wait to see what they're gonna produce in terms of data. So that's something to really look for is what the products are of this uh, international quiet ocean experiment because the pandemic allowed that to happen. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is just highlight a few more examples of where we've learned a little bit more about our ocean systems and these kind of cumulative effects of human activities that we might not have been able to attribute directly or even understand the magnitude of these impacts in our ocean systems prior. And what I'm, I've shown here is a picture of a beach. I'm sure we've all sat on a beach like this and had a gorgeous day. Um, and so what are the effects of humans that kind of hang out at these coastal interfaces and interact with um, species that have extremely high conservation value or cultural value or provide uh, extraordinary ecosystem function? And one of my favorite examples that's come out from about 90 teams from around the world was uh, two labs at the University of Hawaii led by Dr. Rogers and Dr. Madden. And they work in an area, it's a bay that gets over 1 million snorkelers and visitors a year, huge. So sometimes three to 6,000 daily. And so what they were interested in and what they had been monitoring for other reasons was water clarity in this bay. And what they found is that there was a 61% increase in water clarity because of course there weren't people wading in the water, snorkelers um, suspending the sediment into the water column just because um, you know, the number of people at this area decreased to something like five, and it was just the people that were maintaining this, this um, park essentially. So sedimentation decreased, but what we don't know is how that's gonna affect the coral recruitment, so the larvae that were coming in, or other effects on the fish and other species in this system for this time period. In addition, and I think this is something that these groups are now looking at, is of course you have all of these people in the water and they're, they're breaking coral, they're landing on the coral, they're stepping on the coral. So there's all this a physical damage from all of these people in the water. And who would have imagined you could stop a million people from moving into and impacting an area over this time span? It's quite remarkable to think that that is even possible. And then also in this area, the animals changed their behavior because of course people weren't there. There wasn't that many people using the space. And one um, critter that moved in was the endangered Hawaiian monk seal. And so they increased their use of this bay by 51% and were visible for an increase in 51% of the time in this time period. So that's quite uh, interesting and might have implications for the success of these seals or, or maybe not, I'll talk about that at the end. And what I'm finding really interesting is now as this bay reopens, it's doing so with new restrictions on numbers. And from what I can read and, and talking to the research teams who work in this system, it may be that there's permanent changes in this system that is based on the biological information that is coming out of this pandemic era so that this bay and the kind of longevity of this bay and the health of this system is protected into the future. Okay, so last example, and this is one of my very favorite examples. 
because we put so much money into turtles. And so I, I'm an editor at Biological Conservation. Probably at least a third of the papers I get are on turtles. Shar the rest are on sharks and seabirds, mostly. Um, so turtles are so uh, interesting to humans. I think we really, really care about these, these critters. And yet we're still learning. The pandemic has allowed us to learn a little bit about our small impacts that we have and hopefully provide some conservation um, actions that are going to increase the success of many species which are endangered around the world. And one such example comes from Florida and there were loggerhead turtles that uh, increased their nesting success by a remarkable almost 40% during the beach, clover, beach closures. So when I've talked to the scientists, like what, what, what do you think caused this? Uh, their thoughts were that it possibly was light pollution from flashlights at light or car lights or things like sandcastles that are blocking the turtles as they're moving down to the water. Things that you might, like a sandcastle, how could a sandcastle be something that's gonna be a conservation <laughs> hazard for these turtles? But these are the kind of um, things that scientists are now realizing that these impacts might have actually have a greater effect than we realized. And turtles have actually responded. If you just Google turtles, sea turtles and COVID, you get tons and tons of articles from around the world that show all sorts of positive effects from dark and very clean beaches. And I think we knew this before the lockdown, but what's been remarkable is the response in turtles. So it's not that we didn't know that light was disorienting for turtles as they navigate both onto the beach and then as the kind of hatchlings navigate into the water. It was the amount of disorientation from this light. And then also that beaches need to be really clean without umbrellas that are left or holes um, that can really lead um, to these turtles getting trapped and not able to make it down to the water. And then in addition, there's been a whole bunch of effects and I'm not sure of course how this is gonna play out, but in terms of our oceans, a lot of plastics that's been produced is ending up in our oceans. So that's gonna have some negative effects. These effects are going to emerge through time, but it also may help us understand a little bit about the pathways of plastic pollution and how they even end up in the ocean. So I've got fingers crossed it's gonna be positive effect or some positive effects. Um, but of course, as we take a step back, there's some questions now. Is what we've seen due to, due to COVID, is it because 2020 was actually a really great year? I mean. Uh, there was a lot of species that responded positively this year. So it could have been just environmentally a really great year in the ocean for food availability or other variables. So I think one of the key things now is to carry on with the momentum of some of this early research and also to inspire research into which of these effects are transient, which are going to disappear really, really quickly versus which of these effects are actually going to persist or even accumulate and result in some long-term conservation gains. And so from my perspective, this is really the most exciting aspect now because we can even start measuring uh, and designing field programs to capture this recovery period post-COVID. So we've missed some data, maybe we haven't been able to get out into the field, but if this is interesting and engaging, um, there's also some really cool things that we could do as we kind of rebound from this event and society hopefully uh, changes. So I think the other thing is that there's been such an incredible uh, value and recognition for the um, capacity to observe our ocean systems that have been in place. And so hopefully this situation is also going to feed back to funders to really highlight the value of our observatories that are presently um, taking data on our earth and ocean systems. Okay, so I'm guessing that's my 20 minutes about. Um, so what I'd like to do is really thank the Pan Environment Working Group. I think it's been uh, one of the most intense, but also one of the most fun and interesting experience that I've ever done in terms of networking with uh, more than 300 people from around the world. And I'd also just to like shout out some kudos for the Canada Research Chair Program because I'm a marine kind of ecophysiologist, but of course I had funds to put towards a research program or a topic that I thought was really important.
So I'd like to highlight that as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bates, Dr. Amanda Bates. Um, very uh, interesting and uh, I, I like that you um, uh, added the so, some caveats at the end because uh, there's definitely still uncertainties about some of the longer term impacts and uh, and uh, and in particular in the research and education uh, aspects um, as I think uh, uh, Dr. Primack also uh, underlined and our next speaker uh, Dr. Teresa Crimmins is going to be talking uh, focusing especially on one particular aspect of, uh, of education in, um, in biology, but it's specifically sort of nature education, namely uh, citizen science. Um, Teresa Crimmins is a research professor at the School of Natural Resources and the Environment at University of Arizona in Tucson, and is also director of the USA National Phenology Network. Uh, where she works very enthusiastically to support growth and use of phenology data and resources, which are curated by the uh, USA NPN, National Phenology Network. This is an organization that brings together um, thousands of volunteer observers all across the continent um, and uh, research scientists and resource managers and educators and policymakers um, pr to produce maps, um, uh, do forecasts and uh, produce other products to help in management and in policy development as regards, um, you know, all sorts of uh, natural systems. And I think uh, she'll probably tell us a little bit more about that um, organization and also the impacts on citizen science uh, networks from COVID-19. So Dr. Crimmins. Thank you so much, Raymar. I'm really delighted to be a part of this symposium today and really thrilled to get to follow up those amazing talks by Amanda and Richard. Thank you so much. So yeah, as um, Reinmar described, I will be kind of digging into the impacts of COVID-19 shutdowns on some of the community science programs that we have that are popular in our country. Um, and one facet of this, there's many motivating factors for this research, but one of the things that I think is relevant to um, what the previous speakers mentioned was that we have seen a lot of closures in a lot of the traditional forms of monitoring and research um, as a function of closures and shutdowns. And the citizen science programs that I'm talking about potentially um, have the potential to yield data that can help fill some of those gaps that we might be seeing because of those the closures of, the, of those formal programs. So to start and make sure that we're all on the same page, I just want to define um, community science, also known as citizen science or public participation in scientific research. There's a number of different terms that are used to describe basically involving non-professionals non in the scientific endeavor. And this can take a whole lot of forms. It can be anywhere from simply involving volunteers in helping collect observations of anything pretty much, all the way to having community groups identify a question um, and engage scientists in helping them to collect appropriate data, analyze it, synthesize it, and present it. And so the, there are thousands and thousands of citizen or community science programs that are very popular worldwide, and these cover anything from monitoring biodiversity, different species, um, water quality and other parameters, um, weather, uh, and, and they, they extend all around the globe, terrestrial, aquatic, um, oceanic systems, you name it. Some of the really great things about these programs is that by engaging volunteers across the country, data can be collected at a much richer spatial and temporal scale than otherwise can be undertaken by professionals alone. And in many cases, it's really enriched what we've been able to learn about our environment and how it's changing. And the participants tend to benefit as well. Um, there's lots of documentation that participants in these programs see an increase in scientific literacy and the understanding of the scientific process, as well as a deeper appreciation for the place where they're undertaking that research 
and even maybe learning more about the actual physical phenomena that they're observing. This is relevant to me because as Ryan Marr mentioned, I am the director for the USA National Phenology Network. And that's a program that we're tasked basically with keeping track of when stuff happens seasonally across the country. Phenology is when stuff happens, when leaves come out, when birds migrate, yada, yada, you already heard that earlier. Um, and one of the big ways in which we achieve that is to run this community science program called Nature's Notebook. And through that program, tens of thousands of volunteers across the country keep track of when they're seeing stuff happen, like when the leaves on the tree in their backyard come out or change color, or when they see that first bluebird show up in their yard in the spring. So uh, we've already had a really great characterization of what this past spring has looked like globally and in this country. Basically in March, everything kind of hit the brakes and schools shut down and parks and public places closed all over the place. It felt like chaos in my life because suddenly my kids weren't in school anymore and I couldn't go to my office and everybody was just, everything was thrown into the air and they're trying to figure out what to do. And a lot of people recognize, well, there's a cool opportunity here where suddenly we have a lot of time on our hands and we have our kids at home and we don't know what to do with them because the schools are cramp just scrambling trying to figure out how to throw school online or what, what was going to happen. And a lot of smart folks recognize, you know, those community science programs, those citizen science programs can be a really cool opportunity. And so there was a lot of enthusiasm around quick, can we pivot and get folks who are suddenly looking for a way to occupy their own time because maybe they can't go to work or their kids' time because their kids are home underfoot creating problems or just distractions. Um, can we involve them in collecting, participating in these different programs um, through these citizen science programs? And indeed, a lot of people bit. Um, some of the programs, some of the most popular programs saw huge gains in participation this past spring. Um, for example, the Zooniverse, which is the image on the right, is a kind of a whole, literally a universe of a bunch of different citizen science programs that you can participate in without leaving your computer. And there, there are options to um, uh, transcribe weather logs from ships from the past or to help classify galaxies um, and a whole host of other kinds of programs. Um, and they saw three times the rate of participation this past spring than they had in previous springs. Doll Catchers, which is a program that in, engages folks in helping better understand brain waves and what's going on with Alzheimer's and try to move that research along, saw a nearly 40% increase in participation. And the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network, which is a group of folks that mount rain gauges outside and keep track of when they see precipitation, set an all-time record for participation in the month of April, and they've been going for over 20 years. I didn't see the same thing happening in our program, so I got a little anxious. This graph shows the number of participants logging data to Nature's Notebook in the month of April, every year since we launched the program in 2009 through this past April. And as you can see, we had seen very steady growth up until last year. Things were kind of starting to level out. The 2017, 18, 19 years were all kind of flatlined, really, um, when you look at it uh, in aggregate. And so to see barely half of that participation in April of 2020 got me nervous. And so I decided to dig a little bit deeper because I thought, what's going on? If all, if all these other citizen science programs are seeing huge wins and gains in participation, why aren't we? <laughs> and, and I had some ideas of why it might be, but I decided to dig deeper and see what I could learn from it. And what I realized was it would be really cool too to see if other somewhat similar programs saw the same kinds of patterns in participation as well. And so I partnered up with a couple of other wonderful colleagues and we, we chose to explore patterns and the impact of, of the closures due to COVID on these four different biodiversity oriented citizen or community science programs, specifically in the United States. So the first was Nature's Notebook. That's the program that I have run. The second was eBird, which is a very popular bird um, 
basically a bird checklist, uh, bird monitoring tool or program. Uh, the third is eButterfly, which is patterned off of eBird, but you focus on butterflies instead. And the fourth is iNaturalist, which is a really popular um, interface for logging when you see different organisms. All four programs are focused on plants and animals, and actually fungi and mollusks and a lot of other really cool things too. Um, but so they share that similarity in helping um, kind of get characterize what's going on with plants and animals across the country. But they differ kind of dramatically in the way in which you participate. Like I mentioned with iNaturalist, it's pretty simple, honestly. Um, you have an app on your phone, and as I understand it, you're going to counter an, an, an organism. You log it by taking a photo. The photo is date and time and location stamped, and then the community helps you identify what it is, and it's logged as a presence record of that thing. eBird and eButterfly, you create checklists and keep track of what, what um, either birds or butterflies you see at a location on a particular date. But in all those cases, you don't have to be at the same location when you're making your observations. You can pretty much participate from wherever you are, so you're interested. The difference is with Nature's Notebook is that we, we invite you to tell us what you see happening on an individual plant over the course of the season. So re make repeat observations on that same plant through time. So you're kind of fixed in space. And even with animals, we invite folks to report on animals too you're reporting on the animals at a fixed location. So given that everybody's lives were turned upside down in the spring, we had a couple of predictions going into this analysis. We expected that, and this was probably mostly influenced by my experience and by my what I had seen in the data with coming into Nature's Notebook, I expected that there would be a decrease in the number of participants in the spring as a function of COVID and the closures, as well as a decrease in the amount of data coming in. Um, and our, my reasoning was basically folks' lives were turned upside down. And then secondly, all four of those programs pretty much require you to go outside and look at things. Yes, you could argue that you could identify whether your tree has leaves by looking out the window, but in most, in most cases, folks actually go outside and look at and look for stuff. In the period of, of um, spring, when we were that we really focused on, much of the country didn't have that much going on yet, and the weather was crummy, and so that could be a reason why we might see a decrease in participation as well. Um, we did, though, anticipate that because folks were um, locked down and they, um, encouraged strongly to stay at home. We thought that for folks that did participate, we might see an increased participation from within urban areas. And then finally, the, as you probably are aware, the stay-at-home orders varied by state in terms of when they were issued, how long they lasted for, how intense they were, whether they actually happened at all. Um, and so we also reasoned that the length of the stay-at-home orders might have an influence on the, the variables that we were investigating as well. So um, what we did was we needed to take into account the fact that in most cases, these programs have been seeing increased, they have been seeing growth over the past several years. We opted to focus on the, most, the five most recent years and use that to predict what we might see this year and then compare that prediction to what we actually did see. So as an example, on the left, what you're seeing, I realize I didn't label the graph, that's the number of observations that came into Nature's Notebook in the period March through May in each of the years, 2015 through 2019. And as you can see, there's basically an upward trend. And so what we did was plot those points, as you can see on the right, and use that to calculate a um, just a, a linear or a logistic model, whatever fits, and in some cases, the measures were actually um, exponential, rather. And so we used those, those, those data from those previous five years to predict what we thought would, what, what we thought would have happened in 2020 had we not had a crazy lockdown, <laughs> and then compare that to what we actually saw in each of those variables. So we focused on March through May. We evaluated the number of participants in the, each program, 
the number of observations submitted in each program, the fraction of those observations that came from within urban areas, we looked to see if there was a shift in where people were observing. And finally, did the duration of the lockdown hold any predictive power? Did we see some of these increases or decreases in these variables um, change as a function of, of lockdown? And we did we, we calculated these things both on a national scale for each program as well as by state. And so this first graph is showing us what we found in terms of participants. And what, what we're seeing on the y-axis is actually the difference between what was observed and what was predicted for 2020. And so in the first bar, Nature's Notebook, on the left, we saw a 30% drop, basically, which means that we saw 30% fewer participants than we would have expected to see had we not had a pandemic this past year. However, if there's, I, I, I I flag in subsequent graphs, we have, I, I put a star where things are significant. There's no stars on any of these because these were actually not significant changes, meaning that the observed value was not outside of the 95% prediction interval for the model. So even though we did see a 30% decline in what we thought was different from what we thought we should see, it still fell within the range of what was generally what was expected. For e-butterfly and iNaturalist, we saw increases. And as you see, for iNaturalist, it was a big increase, but it's still not significant because iNaturalist has been experiencing exponential growth for the last many years. And the model was predicting a few increase anyway. So even though they didn't, they didn't exceed it, they didn't exceed it until it wasn't significant. And then for eBird, we saw a tiny, really pretty relatively small drop in um, compared to what was expected in terms of participants. This plot is the change in the number of observations or the data coming in. And as, as you can see, it's actually pretty similar to the patterns in participants. Um, for Nature's Notebook, we see a drop in both. In eButterfly and iNaturalist, we see an increase in both. eBird show is the only one that flips. We have you slightly fewer participants in eBird and slightly greater observations in eBird. Um, and so that's interesting because it basically means that we have fewer people collecting more data. Um, and however, probably the most, the thing that stands out the most on this plot is again, Nature's Notebook. <laughs> Sadly, we're the only one with a star, um, which is in this case a sad thing. <laughs> it means that, yeah, we actually did have significantly fewer observations come in this year compared to what was expected. So it did bear out what I was seeing in terms of um, a drop in, in the amount of data coming in. When we look at things on a state-by-state -state basis, I'm just showing a number of observations here. I, in, in the paper that we wrote, we, we have these maps for participants as well, but the maps for participants and observations are actually pretty, pretty similar again. Um, and as you can see, these two, I showed these two first, the plots for um, Eve Butterfly and Nature's Notebook, because of the four programs, these two programs have significantly fewer participants. eBird, or sorry, Eve Butterfly has basically hundreds of individuals or submitting data in the March through May period that we evaluated. And Nature's Notebook is kind of on the order of a thousand or so, whereas the other two programs are more like a hundred thousand. So they're pretty different in terms of how many people are submitting data and how much data are coming in as well. Uh, but what we're seeing on these on these maps are if a state is at one of the blue tones, that means that fewer observations came in this, this spring than we expected based on the previous year's data. And if there are warm tones, then that means those states actually saw more observations come in than was expected based on the previous years. And if the state is hatched, then it's significantly different. It's kind of a mess <laughs> for both of these. Uh, there's not really a clear story to tell. Um, and with e butterfly, we think that it's kind of a mess, mainly because we have small sample sizes. And also, that period March through May just isn't peak butterfly flying time. So, kind of tied to having small sample sizes. When you have really small sample sizes, you're more likely to see large swings and things that people map that look like that. With Nature's Notebook, we had some funky things going on 
basically because we had groups of individuals either popping in or popping out of participating, participating. Um, but again, not a clean and easy story to tell. In contrast, things are kind of clean and easy <laughs> on the other two programs. Uh, we definitely see a, the thing that jumps out the most to me on both of these maps is this funky longitudinal pattern where there's basically a clear pattern of increases, meaning more observations coming in than were expected in the eastern states and fewer than expected in the western states. And when we tried to dig into why this might be, it actually seems like it has a lot to do with different programs, or I'm sorry, different events, especially that those two programs held. Um, and then that's actually the, the, um, the bottom point here. But so the iNaturalist program um, is, is, is the platform that's used in a number of events that are, that are called City Nature Challenges. Uh, where it, it, there's a bioglyph event that's uh, centered in a usually a metropolitan location. And for just a few days, there's a very concerted effort to log as many records on as many organisms as possible in that location. And even though everything was pandemic this past spring, the City Nature Challenge went gangbusters globally in the spring and had far more data points come in than in any previous period of time. Um, and it resulted in major increases in the amount of data that were logged into iNaturalist. Similarly, for eBird, there, um, the Global Global Bird Day happened to fall during that period that we evaluated, which is an annual event similar to City Nature Challenge, where they um, encourage very concerted uh, participation and try to get as many people out logging as many birds as possible on this one day. And that seemed to have a bit of influence. Um, and what we really see is that, especially for city nature challenge, but really for both, a lot of those locations that had the very significant participation were metropolitan areas that were concentrated on the eastern part of the United States, thereby kind of explaining that, that longitudinal pattern we were seeing. And then again, as I mentioned previously, some of those other reasons why we might see, be seeing, especially the messy <laughs> maps for the for our nutritional book and for e butterfly, are that these programs require you to go outside, and not everybody was that keen about going on outside in the spring. Not great butterfly time of year. And then finally, really for nature's notebook, um, the fact that you need to actually go out to the same site repeatedly and make observations was a big obstacle for a number of people in March and April because a lot of our participants had been collecting data at public locations like parks, public city or county or state or national parks that were closed or nature centers or other facilities that were just people couldn't access them. And so we put a lot of effort into helping folks recognize that they could still participate and please, you know, really encouraging them to please register a new site, say in your backyard that you can access and then go back to those other facilities once they're open again. So we, we did see an uptick after that, but there seemed to be that lag where folks were um, struggling to figure out how to continue to participate. So then our, our third question was whether we would see um, a shift toward urban participation in urban areas. And interestingly, this fell out neatly along those two programs, the program size, basically nature shows with the e butterfly, the two growth programs with fewer participants really didn't see much of a change and it wasn't significant, but iNaturalist and eBird did see big, significant increases toward participation in urban areas. And this is a map by state of that shift toward urban, uh, urban areas. And as you can see for eButterfly, <laughs> there was a big decrease, a big move away from urban areas in all the middle states, everything that's blue. Um, for nature's notebook, it's a big mess, <laughs> very mixed, uh, but really a, a shift toward, toward urban in the east. Um, and then a big shift in toward urban data collection in iNaturalist and eBird. And you can see in eBird, in many states, there were significant shifts toward more urban um, data points. And then our final question was the one about whether the duration of the lockdown in the state would would have any explanatory power toward any of the patterns that we saw? And basically the answer is no. 
there were of um, oh, I think it's I think it was 24 things we tested, only three came out even significant or marginally significant. Um, and this is what they are basically nature don't put the e butterfly. Yes, we did see um, an increase in observation, urban observations as a function of longer lockdowns. So the longer a state had a lockdown, the more likely it would be to have a greater proportion of observations coming from urban areas. And then for e butterfly, it was even more marginal to say that the length of the lockdown um, had a positive influence on the number of participants. Um, but I think that and these are for the whole US together. Um, I think the reason why we don't see stronger patterns is that basically <laughs> the messy map that we saw previously means that we're kind of, um, there's more of a nuanced, um, finer green spatial pattern than what we can pick up here at this broad scale. For our take home points here, were that most of the programs actually didn't ex exhibit the decreases in participation or incoming data that I thought we would, which is ours. <laughs> Um, but that's a good thing. It's a good thing that we're not seeing that pattern happening in all of the different programs that are focused on logging biodiversity data. It's actually very encouraging. We did see those interesting longitudinal patterns that we can, that we had to dig further to make sense of. We definitely saw the, in, the clear influence of focused events like City Nature Challenge, BioClips events, and the Global Bird Day as a way to keep folks engaged. And a pretty clear shift among almost everybody for the participation in urban areas. I'm going to end on a promising sign. <laughs> this is back to nature public only. This is the number of observers in the month of October. And what you can see is that we did see steady growth since the beginning of the program up until about 2015, and then it's been flat ever since. But the fact that 2020 is flat with the previous years makes me very happy. <laughs> so. Hopefully we're on an upward trend or at least a leveling off trend. Um, we're not continuing to hemorrhage folks and that is a very encouraging, gives me a big sigh of relief. And where do we go from here? Well, I definitely acknowledge that uh, focusing on the March to May lockdown period was perhaps a little naive because truthfully, when we were analyzing these data in the middle of summer, I think all of us had this Pollyanna, perhaps just naive um, expectation that we, we had gotten to the worst of it and we were going to have to lock down again, um, but that we were, you know, think we're on the upswing. And I think right now we realize that that's not the case. And so we might need to revisit these analyses, honestly, and um, look at subsequent periods um, or a, a, a more extended period of, of impact on on COVID, just talking about COVID more broadly and its impact on um, participation in these programs. And additionally, uh, an important takeaway for me was that, holy cow, having these concentrated events, like again, City Nature Challenge or Global Bird Day, can have a pretty significant impact on the participation in the program. And so that may be something for the other programs, like Nature's Netflix and eButterfly to think about. I want to quickly acknowledge my colleagues that, that worked with me on this project, as well as, of course, all of the many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of wonderful participants in each of the four programs and all of the city, uh, community science programs around the globe. And with that, we'll conclude. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Teresa. Dr. Teresa Crimmins giving a very um, uh, a nice deep view of um, some interesting data. Um, and I guess that you're collecting, uh, continuing to collect that data on a, on a monthly basis into the future. And so that's gonna be very interesting to see how this all, all develops. And I, I think we, we could probably talk some more about this um, in, in the round table, but one of the things that I've found very interesting and, and actually rather disappointing in the, the public management of this uh, crisis has been that there was so much emphasis on people should stay indoors. And it always seemed to me like that's kind of the reverse of what people should be saying. People should go outdoors, you know, be in national parks. We'll hear about that from, from Abe a, as well. And should be using iNaturalist, Nature's Notebook and, and all the other citizen science 
programs because that's a pretty safe thing to do under under these conditions. So it's very unfortunate that that it had at least at the beginning had this negative impact. But I'm I'm wondering whether that impact is going to go away uh, with with time. So we can but hope. Yeah. And on that note, we will um, turn to uh, Dr. Abe Miller Rushing who is uh, specifically working in uh, and with national parks. Um, and uh, uh, Abe is a science coordinator at the National Park Service um, based in Acadia National Park in Bar Harbor, Maine. Pretty nice place to have a, work, have a job and, and live. Um, in Arcadia he's, uh, Acadia, he's building a science program which um, connects science with education and management. So looking at those sort of three prongs, science, education, and management as different uh, prongs of the same fork, as it were. Um, and he's developing um, uses of citizen science to achieve meaningful outcomes in science, education, and society. And uh, so interested both in uh, the management of the parks and in involving people in, in creative and constructive ways in the parks and the park system. His own research is focused particularly on phenology, um, ex-student of Dr. Primack, as a matter of fact, and um, focused on long-term changes in ecological communities. And um, so looking forward to hearing um, some of the impacts about, of COVID on use and management of national park systems. Dr. Abe Miller rushing. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for the introduction. And yeah, I think uh, the other talks um, set up mine uh, very nicely. Um, some of the themes I'll be touching on. Um, doo -doo -doo. Let's see, can you guys see my screen? Oops, Look, you probably see the wrong view. Yep. Now you see the right view? That's uh, coming up now, yep. Super. Okay. So um, I'm going to be talking uh, about uh, work uh, that we've done recently uh, on COVID-19 and U.S. national parks, um, exactly linking science management and public engagement um, specifically. Uh, and I have been doing this work with a, a number of colleagues, including Richard Premack, and I think Amanda Galanat's on in the audience right now. Um, but a number of other, too many to list, a number of other folks across the National Park Service um, and several partner organizations as, as well. Um, so to just start with, um, I'm going to go over some details just to kind of give an idea of the National Park's kind of role in conservation and education. Um, and the economy. Uh, so national park, we have about 420 national park units in the US. Uh, together they protect about uh, 34 million hectares and host thousands of research projects each year, including long-term monitoring of ecosystem health in all of the parks. Um, the national parks also have a big role for public engagement. Uh, we attract more than 300 million people each year uh, engage millions of students in school programs um, and really are one of the largest informal learning institutions in the world. Um, and I think a number of uh, people in the US at least uh, and, and internationally get inspired to go into co uh, conservation or ecology or related fields uh, from experiences in national parks. Um, and, and even for those that don't go into those careers are inspired um, to, uh, to do stewardship kind of activities and, and things. And so it's where a lot of people get connected with nature and have life-changing experiences. And then national parks also contribute a lot to the economy. Um, in the US, uh, national parks contribute about 40, $41.7 billion to the economy each year. Visitors spend about $21 billion in communities right around national parks. Um, and then the parks support about 329,000 jobs across the country. So uh, the pretty big roles in, in terms of conservation and, and public engagement and the, the US economy. And so to do this, um, the examples that I'm gonna be talking about in terms of the impacts of COVID-19 on parks, uh, 
came from surveys of staff and partner organization park partner organizations across the National Park Service. They were informal surveys early in the spring, early in the pandemic, and actually through the summer too. Um, and so most of this is going to be kind of anecdotal, kind of uh, although there will be some data as well. But but a lot of it's kind of uh, varied results park to park, depending upon what state it was in and whatnot. But just to give the bottom line right up front, so no surprises at the end, um, the the COVID the effects of COVID-19 were profound, which isn't a shocker. Uh, the pandemic really revealed complex interactions among the park operations, uh, research, management, and public engagement. And it forced a lot of trade-offs, forced managers to make a lot of trade-offs and researchers, but opened opportunities too, which I'll talk about more um, later in the talk. So just as an outline, I'm going to go through uh, relatively quickly in each of these, but talk a little bit about fundamental operations for the parks, um, how COVID-19 affected those, and the research and management, public engagement, and then kind of some of the lessons we learned. Um, a lot of people most, like parks were in the news most probably because of closures. Um, just to give a summary of the closures for the parks, uh, of the 64 national parks that are actually named national parks, not national monuments, not national seashores and so on, of those 64, 32 of them closed at some point. Uh, there was a lot of variability though. Um, you know, almost half of them didn't close at all. Um, and, but then you had parks like Yosemite that were closed for 83 days, all the way from March to through June. Um, and uh, the Southwest parks actually kind of give a good example of some of this variability. The parks in New Mexico, like Carlsbad Caverns and White Sands, um, in line with state regulations, uh, largely closed in March and remained kind of restricted operations uh, through the summer. Um, in Arizona, parks like Grand Canyon and Saguaro uh, at the request of the governor remained open to out provide access to outdoor activities um, throughout indoor activities were closed parks located in and around the navajo nation like canyon de Chez and, and navajo um, remained closed through september so um, uh, and then in texas at parks like big bend and guadalupe mountains uh, <laughs> they varied a lot because uh, state uh, state guidance in Texas varied a lot throughout the, um, and so even in, in this kind of closed regional area, you had a lot of variation in how parks responded to the pandemic uh, in response to state guidance. Um, park uh, ad administrative things you could imagine were really affected uh, by COVID-19. Of course, we had to implement, spent a lot of time implementing safety protocols for everybody to be able to do their job. It slowed the work pace as everybody transitioned to remote work, uh, those that could anyhow. Um, and of course, we had lots of meetings focused on dealing with the uncertainty and, and rapidly changing conditions. Um, but one of the housing had a, had, was probably the biggest kind of hidden impact. So national parks during the summer, especially a lot of them, um, depend a lot on seasonal employees. And, and so in Acadia, for instance, in the summertime, two thirds of our employees are seasonals. And because uh, there's generally most of the housing around national parks are very expensive aimed at, at, aimed at visitors. So we end up providing housing and largely in shared housing units. So they're shared bedrooms and whatnot. And with COVID-19, we couldn't really do that. So we could only house one person per bathroom um, in, in order to, uh, for safety reasons, in, in case people tested positive or had symptoms and had to isolate. Um, and so that in different parks reduced their capacity to hire seasonals by 30 to 70%. Um, so that dramatically reduced the amount of staff national parks were able to hire. And most of the parks that um, emphasize hiring for maintenance staff and law enforcement staff to be able to deal with the increased cleaning um, requirements during the pandemic, cleaning restrooms, cleaning, managing trash, cleaning buildings, disinfecting, all of that stuff, and managing public safety. And so that further reduced our capacity to hire seasonals for resource management and interpretation 
and other park functions. Um, so we were, we were short staffed all summer long. Um, and, and really the people that got hit the hardest by this was fewer, you know, was early career folks, whether it was interns or early career positions, um, entry level positions in parks. Um, so many internships and, and early career positions were never filled, um, uh, particularly in resource management and interpretation. Others were filled, but people had to work remotely. And if you're getting an internship in a national park and you have to re work remotely, that sucks. You do not get an internship in a national park to work from home. Um, that's not the point. And, and you miss also, uh, you also miss the networking opportunities that come from, um, from being able to work um, in a park. Um, Yellowstone, for example, is photoed here, um, canceled all its residential internships like its um, Youth Conservation Corps, which is photoed here, and, and converted them to day work programs with fewer folks. And so you can imagine a lot of people who weren't able to get there on their own and live there on their own, weren't able to take and you know, miss that opportunity this year. Visitation at national parks was really, um, really varied a lot. Um, and so uh, this is the average across the 64 national parks that are, that are the kind of ones that are called strictly national parks. Um, but you can see this, uh, the dashed line is last year and then the, the solid line is this year. Um, you can see a really big dip in March and April during the peak of the pandemic in May. And then you can see that there was this really rapid um, return to uh, close to normal and some parks actually exceeded normal. There were some parks that were setting records for attendance during in June and July and August. Um, and that, you know, we weren't able to hire new staff to, to, uh, to kind of help uh, manage those crowds. And so um, that further kind of strained park capacity. Um, but uh, but it was, it, it's, a, it's kind of a, normally we consider it a good problem when people really wanna connect um, with parks. Uh, this year was a more stressful problem than normal. Um, but it was great that we were able to provide an opportunities for people to, to kind of get their recreation opportunities and um, meet their physical and mental health needs this year. Um, but that dip in the, in the visitor season remained longer in some parks and, and, you know, in a lot of parks, even where it didn't extend throughout the whole season, their local communities were really hurt. Um, uh, a lot of partner organizations. A lot of partner organizations rely on running on revenue from programs they run during the visitor season, and a lot of them had to furlough employees or even close entirely for this year. Um, and local communities' uh, economies were hurt too. Uh, these pictures are from Denali's visitor community, and and there at Denali is an extreme example, but it's interesting because 90% of their visit, so their visitation dropped by more than 90% this year. Um, and their local community depends, uh, their municipal budget depends 80% of its budget comes from tourist driven revenue. Um, so they're, you know, and that's extreme, but most, a lot of gateway communities, including ours in Bar Harbor really had hard times this year. I have a neighbor who, you know, manages bus tours and he was out of work all summer long. Um, so going into the resource and manage resource management issues. So a lot of resource management uh, projects were delayed um, uh, as were research projects. The Park Service, uh, our research permits, so we require permits for research projects, which helps us track how many are going on. Uh, our research during the peak of the pandemic were, was down about 37% of normal. Um, and a lot of projects were uh, canceled, delayed, or scaled back. Uh, Long-term monitoring was interrupted, and that meant a lot of our monitoring operations missed springtime phenology events for a guy who thinks a lot about phenology. Air monitoring was really the only thing that, that was kind of universally went through the full, you know, uninterrupted, largely because it was, um, uh, it was mostly automated or could be managed by one person working alone. Um, but anything that required teams to travel in cars or vehicles or helicopters or like together as teams, uh, 
really wasn't possible for most of this summer um, because of safety restrictions. So an example, Great Smoky Mountains, which has more research projects than any other national park in the system, uh, they had uh, 126 permitted projects at the beginning of the pandemic. 10, 10 of them got canceled, 16 were delayed by a year, 28 were reduced by scope, uh, reduced their scope, and 54 went roughly as planned, um, and 15, uh, at, at least at the end of the summer, weren't, I think they must have been fall projects, but uh, they weren't certain how they were going to turn out. So that gives you a taste for some of the variability. In terms of examples of management projects, um, at Sequoia Kings Canyon, as an example, uh, their de delayed bear proofing of restrooms, which actually meant that they had more bears getting into some of their restrooms that needed repairs, um, which meant they had to haze and manage the bears more than they would like to. Um, across the Park Service, there were delays in invasive species, man invasive plant management, which meant that a lot of plants had an opportunity to set seed, grow, um, so it set back management operations a little ways. Um, so management will be more difficult in the future because of that. At Sequoia and Kings Canyon, they also had to delay uh, management uh, and study of bark beetles. They ended up missing the flight season of the bark beetles. And so that was a, a big bummer for them. And then they also had to delay fish removal. This, these were um, uh, introduced non-native fish uh, in high elevation ponds uh, where removing them was essential for the aid, the recovery of the yellow-legged uh, frog, which is endangered, uh, which they're trying to. And so, so these, you can imagine that these have some short-term impacts and the long-term impacts are hard to know, but, but certainly it's going to make management more expensive and it, it could mean that certain species are in, a, in more trouble than they would have been otherwise. For public engagement now, um, really kind of public experiences in parks really changed a lot. Uh, public programs, most public programs are canceled. These are programs that on the left here that was offered at the end of the summer here in Acadia. People had to register, they had to socially distance, um, but there was a lot more um, uh, online engagement in parks. And so here you can see a graph of these are page views at um, to the Park Service's education pages um, uh, across the Park Service. And, and the, what the lines are is the number of page views. Blue is 2020 and kind of yellow orange is uh, 2019 last year. And it goes from January through the end of August. I'm going to draw your attention to this area, which is kind of between March and June when schools went remote. Uh, it turns out that we had a huge bump, millions of additional views of, uh, yeah, so those those are an order of, those are in, that's 4 million views, I believe, um, kind of if you're looking at the axis. Um, and so there was a lot more use of our education web, page, web pages during the remote learning. Um, and I believe that we're seeing that again now that once the school year started up this this fall. And then other, and a lot of parks embrace the change uh, to really shift uh, uh, experiences to online. Um, so a lot of parks uh, partnered with other organizations to create online resources for schools. Um, and, and then other parks like this, uh, this consortium of 24 parks and national parks in Arizona runs a biennial festival that's usually in person, but this year happened online. Um, and, and they attracted thousands of people to engage with their festival online, which was great. And so what are some of the lessons we learned through this? Um, one, we kind of got an opportunity to stress test our ability to adjust and how our monitoring, you know, I, Richard and Amanda talked about this earlier. So we, we had an opportunity to see how does our monitoring hold up when uh, we have a huge disruption. Um, we were able to access our data well. Um, we, a lot of our, we weren't able to do a lot of our monitoring in the field, but kind of we did have an interesting um, event. So our inventory and monitoring program in the park service 
uh, held a what they called a stats off, kind of like a hackathon, very specialized for stats, um, and and where they brought together 50 quantitative ecologists to brainstorm and develop techniques to handle the uh, changes caused by the pandemic in terms of sampling and analysis of the long-term monitoring. And, and, and Park Service wide, we monitor things like forest health, water quality, and other kind of uh, indicators of ecosystem integrity. And so what they identified was that given the circumstances, it really wasn't worth the effort uh, to to do reduced sampling this year, given the cost in terms of statistical power and whatnot. And so what, what we have ended up doing is most of our inventory monitoring programs took those resources and are reinvesting to increase monitoring next year. And most of them um, spent um, increased time doing data analysis of past data this year. So cleaning up data and analyzing things and, and whatnot this year. Um, we also recognize that we really need to invest in early career researchers and managers, that when there's a disruption like this, they get hit the hardest, for sure. Um, uh, and, and this includes also folks that are underrepresented in these fields. Um, and we really need to have strong support systems for them, uh, or we risk losing talented folks um, and disrupting our, our workforce. Um, and there's actually a, uh, we have a, a number of, we're incidentally, so we were already doing this before the pandemic, but we're increasing, the park services increase and our partner organizations are increasing investments in early career fellowships and internships. And this one actually happens to be open right now for anybody who's interested this summer in a, in a, in a summer gig all, from anywhere from undergraduates uh, to grad students, uh, there are opportunities in here. Um, uh, if you, uh, through the Scientists in Parks program, uh, it, you can use this URL or you can just Google Scientists in Parks um, and it should turn up. Um, but the announcements are open now through sometime in January, I think they close. Um, and we also recognize we need to increase our remote engagement. National Parks uh, typically bread and butter is engaging people in the place like physically, like when people come, but of course a lot of people can't get to a lot of our national parks. And so we seized the opportunity and a lot of parks invested in training their staff on, on the job, um, on how to you know do live broadcasts from parks, do ranger programs that were live that uh, could engage people all over the world and, and people that we don't normally um, aren't able to reach very effectively. And so this is likely to be an area where we the Park Service continues to invest in in the future. Um, and we need to encourage park engagement for health. This is again something that the parks had been doing, working with um, on healthy parks, healthy people. There were doctors writing prescriptions for folks to be able to go to, to, go to national parks for whether for physical or mental health. Um, but we really this year saw a lot of increased visitation specifically for um, physical and mental health. And uh, we expect that the, and especially in urban parks, parks near urban areas, um, like the Boston Harbor Islands or the, the parks, the national parks in the Boston area. Um, uh, so, and Cape Cod too, saw, saw lots of visitation. Um, and kind of, I think this is my last one. Uh, we need kind of reinforcing this, that we need to increase our flexibility to respond to big events. Uh, the National Park Service, we're a big bureaucracy. Um, we are not nimble <laughs> by a long ways. Um, and, but, but big events, pandemics, hurricanes, fires, um, things will continue to disrupt us, uh, our operations in unpredictable ways. It's, but it's eminently predictable that the, we will be seeing more of these kinds of disruptions. Um, and so uh, while we're doing it slowly, because as the bureaucracy we are, we do recognize the need to increase our flexibility um, and are do, trying to take actions to, um, to be able to 
to build that flexibility. And actually, the, some of the changes that have happened th through the pandemic, I think, will will benefit us going forward, responding to future disturbances. With that, I'll end. Thanks a bunch. Thank you very much, Abe, uh, Dr. Abe Miller, rushing. Um, Awesome uh, examples and uh, insight into what's going on in the national park system uh, and a lot of the variability there, I guess. Um, different parks reacting in different ways, different parts of the country. Uh, very interesting. And um, so I, I've, we've got quite a few uh, questions, both in the Q&A and, uh, well, I've got uh, questions from my, <coughs> from my class, my conservation biology class that is here. Um, and uh, in the audience and um, has submitted questions already. So we've got more questions than we'll be able to get to, definitely, um, but uh, some very interesting ones. And I think um, that uh, issue about the, um, the variability in, uh, in responses in the, in the park um, sort of leads in a segue into a, a question that a couple of people had, which is, um, is there data about um, and I guess this would be for Abe and also Teresa. Is there data about different age groups um, using the parks or um, or using the uh, the nature, you know, the citizen science um, uh, things? Because it, one could imagine that there would be divergence there, where maybe young young people might be using them more, old people less. Um, is there any data, Teresa and or Abe, on on that? Teresa, maybe uh, you, you could start. Sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> I can speak most knowledgeably about the Nature's Notebook program, um, but I don't think it's necessarily representative of all programs. You know, each program has a different um, reason for being and aim. Um, some are more, uh, have, a, have a focus more on simply getting folks outside or engaged with a particular topic. Um, so mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. simply straight up education. And I think those ones tend to engage a broader range of, of folks' backgrounds and, and age groups. And others, more like Nature's, Nature's Notebook, we're really, we know we are asking a lot in what we ask of, of folks. Um, and that the reason for that is that generating data that is of significant rigor and quality to be used in, this, in science and in decision making is our primary aim. And whether folks learn stuff from it is of secondary consequence. Um, because it's really pretty difficult to, to thread the needle on both of those, those aims together. Um, what we, we don't do a ton of surveying of our participants, but we, what we generally know is that our participants tend to be um, college educated um, and typically a little bit older, um, adults and older adults in particular. And we believe the reason for that is that, again, we're asking folks to take on a significant responsibility of ideally looking at different organisms and logging information on them multiple times a week throughout the course of the growing season, maybe for many years on end. That's what our ideal observer looks like. And that's just a, a pretty big commitment that younger folks who have a lot of job and family commitments and other things is, it's just a, a, a big ask. And so we tend to see folks of retirement age, um, and uh, especially when they can participate with, with others as, and make it a social activity, that's where we seem to have the, the longest um, retention in individuals. But I, but I think really, when you look at citizen science or community science broadly, um, nearly every age group and, and skill level and, and interest is covered by, by some program somewhere. Mm -hmm. Great, um, uh, you know, Abe, I'm wondering, um, in the case of the parks, um, whether uh, you know you saw a, a fair, fairly large bump in uh, in in use of parks, at least some of the parks, and is the variability um, depend? Does it depend more on geographic location, or you know how the uh, COVID uh, crisis is being managed in different areas, or you know what is the variability sort of dependent on? I, I think both. Um, I think. Uh... I think areas that were parks that were open and close to urban areas got swamped. Um, Indiana Dunes, which is near uh, near Chicago, I think like smashed all their visiting visitation records. I think they may have even doubled or 
like their their visitation past visitation records uh, and Tonto National Monument, which is near Phoenix, even in the summer, I mean, it was like hundreds, you know, it was like 114, 100, you know, it was it was really hot and they were breaking records for visitation um, uh, because people just wanted to go to places that they were out outdoors where they, you know, you were talking about wanting to go outdoors. Um, but we, by October here in Acadia, you know, we're five hours from you guys in Boston. Um, and we, we hit our October high this year. So we've had, we, this year we had more visitors than, than we've ever had in any previous October. And that was even without um, bus tours, which are a, a big thing for fall foliage leaf peeping in the fall here. So people were driving themselves. They really wanted to get out before the winter. Um, yeah, and in terms of age groups, I think, you know, all our school group visits were canceled this past year um, and haven't, so all the young, I would say our young kids are mostly engaging via online. Um, and we have, we have probably more older, um, you know, adults coming uh, in person among the people who are coming in person and actually a lot more college kids we have University of Maine, which is within striking distance and without college parties and whatnot as much, we are seeing a whole lot more college kids in the park than normal. Yeah, interesting. And your point on, uh, on uh, urban, you know, versus more distant, um, you know, sort of locations brings up another question that a couple of people have, uh, have, have submitted um, about the urban uh, observations of wildlife, which of course, you know, we've sort of read about some of them in the, in the news or heard about some of them in the news. Um, but also, uh, Teresa was talking about um, that, uh, you know, urban observations um, of wildlife increased even while other ones were maybe going down. And so there was a, there was a question about whether that has to do with people simply being uh, around their their house more, uh, or, or at least around their neighborhood or something, or maybe whether there was actually more wildlife around in the urban area. Um, and uh, maybe both of you might have something to say about that too. Oh, I mean, I think that's certainly true that I've, I mean, this last several months, I mean, I've spent far more time outside than I ever have before walking. Mm -hmm. And I, but I think also the animal populations are in general tending to increase in urban areas. So, I mean, we do have increasing wildlife, expansion of wildlife into urban areas. So I think that's a combination of people spending more time outside, animal populations increasing, maybe animals being kind of less afraid because of fewer cars and, and airplane noise. So I think those are all things contributing and, it, and it's, it's very hard to separate them. And that's why long-term monitoring um, of the type that Amanda was talking about is really the key to this where you, you really have, you know, a, a consistent monitoring over a long time. And, and depending on the circumstances, in some cases you've seen increase, and other cases you've seen decreases in wildlife, depending on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, what, one of the variations, uh, oh, so Teresa, you wanted to make a comment there. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I think what Richard says is true. And in our case, I don't, I think it's more that we were what we're seeing is the the signature of, of folks where you know participating where they're at in their own activities and movements being constrained. Mm -hmm. um, although I mean since especially since I naturalist is focused on logging stuff, there's there is the potential that if there were kind of anomalous things showing up in people's neighborhoods that hadn't been there before, I could see people running out and snapping a photo and, and documenting that. Um, but I'm not sure if there would be enough of those things to really register the kind of boost that we saw since the big shift. So, um, yeah, I yeah. think there's lots to unpack, really. I, I really feel like in our study, we just barely scratched the surface, truthfully. Yeah, definitely. And I'm sure it'll be, it'll be changing, um, you know, on a monthly basis. Um, Amanda, uh, for, um, for you, there was a question about, um, which sort of relates, actually, about the, the possible contrast between uh, regulated shipping and fishing activities um, in marine areas versus unregulated stuff. And, um, and, and I guess for Richard as well, I mean, there's also a lot of illegal activity that might have increased, uh, especially if you're looking on a global scale. 
not just in the in the U.S. Uh, illegal logging. I mean, uh, hunting. Have these kind of things been been uh, affected by by COVID, as far as anyone can tell at this point? Yeah. Amanda, you're muted. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Uh, yes, so there's been an increase in all sorts of illegal activities for various reasons, um, not only just to protect livelihoods, which Richard mentioned, but also because people just were looking for things to do. So there were some really interesting reports, for instance, in the United Kingdom about like, like people taking out endangered vultures with hunting. And um, there's also, I mean, I know a lot you know, I've been working both in terrestrial and ocean examples, and the ones that are actually coming to mind are are from terrestrial kind of systems. But one of my favorites was from the Maldives, where um, this was legal, but anyone that was in the kind of police force was allowed to hunt. So apparently, like wildlife was just decimated in the Maldives. That's a secondhand, you know, report. I don't actually know. I haven't verified that. But um, we do have data from our pan environment group that really shows um, illegal activities and illegal hunting activities, both in the ocean and land kind of all over the world. I mean, we have these two very interesting examples from Boston where, um, you know, in a lot of the parks in the Boston area that there were just greatly increased numbers of people coming into the parks and using mountain bikes. And so people were just using mountain bikes everywhere in, in places that were clearly posted with for no bicycles and people were just ignoring the regulations. And another one is kind of um, swimming. So there's actually a number of places in, in the Boston area which are nice for swimming, but people don't normally swim there because there are police and city officials there. And because of the pandemic, there was, there was no enforcement in these places. So great increase in, in kind of illegal swimming activity. Um, you know, those are you know, obviously not as serious as illegal logging and illegal hunting, but I mean, they demonstrate even in, in a well-organized city like Boston, what can happen when there isn't city officials and, and enforcement to stop this kind of activity. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I'd be curious to know where those places in Boston were that people <laughs> were swimming. So you, so you can go there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, next time I'm there. <laughs> um, but it, that leads me to another question that somebody had submitted earlier. Um, which has to do also with sort of bad behavior that may have been released by the by the COVID. Um, not necessarily bad, strictly speaking, but um, the use of disposables, uh, you know, as opposed to, I mean, the, the heavy increase in, in certain kind of chemicals, right, for cleaning and uh, uh, hand uh, uh, disinfectants and so forth, but also um, possible, uh, you know, disposable stuff like uh, packaging and things like that, because people are, are concerned about, um, or at least were concerned about infection rates. I don't, I don't know whether this has uh, changed since some of the research is now showing that infection rates are almost entirely um, through the air rather than through uh, surfaces. But, uh, but in any case, I, I think I did see sort of anecdotally People using, um, uh, you know, dis uh, disposable stuff and, and throwing it away. A lot of plastics. I wonder if if there's been any uh, any looking at um, at the long longer term impact of that kind of behavior. So, Abe, what's happening in the parks with that? Yeah, we, we, I mean, we definitely see mask litter. Um, so there's masks on trails. Um, in a lot of in a lot of places, um, and my guess is if that's happening in national parks where we typically have a lot less litter problem, people people really, honest to goodness, don't want to litter in national parks by by and large. Um, that that problem is is much worse in, in other places. Um, I think. What about, I, your, what about all your cleaning chemicals? Yeah, uh, right. Our safety guidance hasn't change so even as the um at least to my knowledge the guy you know even though we know that science is telling us that, that the transmission is mostly the, via the air we still have the same basic protocols in place you know here to clean services um after use and whatnot um you know it just hasn't the the science hasn't trickled down to the to the actual on the ground policies yet uh, my guess is that's the case for most businesses. Mm 
but I, I don't know if others of the speakers, Amanda, if you have more insights into that in terms of the marine litter um, or, or other things. I don't, I just know that it's really, really increased, but I haven't been collating data on it. I know but but it, has, it has increased, you think? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, in, in a way it's, it's kind of um, odd that the, uh, the, in a way that, the, in, num in the past years, there's been increasing focus on plastic, uh, uh, plastic waste and, and, uh, and so forth. And, and people have, I think, responded well, but it didn't take very much for that to, in a way, kind of be, you know, turned around and gone back to some earlier um, not great behaviors. Would you say that that's being borne out from what you have observed? Well, maybe the behaviors, sure, but I think we're just producing so much more plastic pollution. I'm going to guess it'll be 25% more globally or something. I think I've heard that stat from a colleague who's collecting this kind of information. So I think when the data and information on how much we've actually produced to deal with this protective gear that's needed, it's going to be a little boggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know I've uh, sure accumulated an awful lot of takeout containers <laughs> trying to support local restaurants, but the downside of it is all these containers and I don't know what to do with them. We need to come up with art projects or something. <laughs> yeah, and I guess uh, so some of the uh, recycling opportunities have have fallen by the wayside in the last uh, last year so due, due to more to uh, you know, political, global political dynamics than anything, I guess. But um, here's another question for Dr. Primek. How can you explain the difference between, that you showed on the maps, between park visitation in South America and South Africa compared to North America and North Europe? I thought that was quite, uh, quite provocative as well. What's the difference there? I'm going to give that question to uh, Abe Miller Rushing since he works for the Park Service. All right, very good. You're going to have to... What was, what was the, remind me what the difference was that you? Well, well, parks in the United States and Northern Europe have seen greatly increased park visitation and parks in South America and South Africa um, have seen a big decrease. Right. I, I just, think, you know, I mean. This is a return to your qualifying exams. <laughs> That's right. I, I think, you know, a lot of it, I don't, I, I haven't talked to the folks in, in other in, in some of those other parts of the world. But my guess is it has to do with, you know, standards of living and, and remoteness of the parks and ability to access um, access them during the pandemic. Um, and, and also government responses have varied in a lot of, a lot of places. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, people's ability to, to, in the U.S., we have a lot of people who are able to get in a car and get to a national park, and in different ways, um, uh, and who are able to kind of make it through the other parts of the pandemic. Okay, um, but we... I, I would have answered that a little different, Abe. All uh, right, well, you go for so, it. I mean, a lot of a lot of visitation to the Latin American parks and to the South and to the South African parks are actually international visitors, right. and so the international visitors can travel um, because of the pandemic. And whereas the North American visitors and the North and Europe ones are, are just more local visitors. So within country visitors. Well, and even, I, yeah. I would, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say when I chatted with our colleagues in Colombia and Brazil, they were also saying that to me that people locked down, like they weren't leaving their homes and they didn't leave their homes for a long, long period of time. So it was also how the lockdown manifested mm -hmm. in different places. Yeah, and, and I would even, even the international travel, like I think most people that are visiting national parks in the US and I would suspect it's the same in Europe, but you know, they're doing it in driving distance of home. Like it's not even international, it's like close, like within a day's drive. Um, so our visitation demographics really changed a lot this year. Almost everybody was from New England. Um, uh, and, and right, we saw almost no international visitation um, yeah, so anyhow, I think that that's a big driver of the change, yes. I'd like to um, 
I'd like to open the, uh, uh, the, the themes up here just a little bit into the sort of political sphere. We haven't gotten into that very much, but I think it's important uh, for, you know, audience and, and for scientists and for us to, to think about some of the implications of the way the, uh, this, you know, crisis has been managed um, quite differently in different places, but, but nevertheless not very successfully in very many places, in, in some places, yes. Um, but I'm just wondering um, what you all think about the idea, that's a pr proposal that I would make, a proposition that um, that this is in a way uh, like a little dry run for um, some of the severe impacts of climate change that we're looking at um, in in the future, not too distant future possibly. Um, since we've seen that a lot of the p uh, political responses were you know, somewhat chaotic um, in this country and, and in other places as well, and, um, and very divisive and, and created quite a bit of conflict. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, if you see sort of, the, uh, the, you know, any reflections or something that we need to think about and take into, into consideration for future planning about, about climate impacts. Uh, Dr. Primack, you want to start off? <laughs> Um, well, I think it, it, it tells us that if, if things have been this divisive dealing with climate change, they're going to be probably equally divisive, it's equally, it can be, if they've been this divisive dealing with the pandemic, then, I mean, it doesn't um, suggest that we're going to be able to handle dealing with climate change, even with the administration coming in and, and supposedly dealing with climate change, there's still likely to be conflict both within the United States and, and internationally dealing with climate change. Also, people thought that, that the pandemic would be a good idea of what, what we could accomplish as a society in terms of dealing with this crisis. Um, but in fact, even with this vast shutdown in the economy, um, there was only a very minor disruption of the production of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So it's, it suggests that we're really going to have to use some other really radically different technology than just simply um, shutting down the, the transportation system to really, um, you know, deal with the problems of greenhouse gas emissions. So I think, I think that, that this tells us that, that it, it's going to be very challenging dealing with, the, the clim with climate change and that the pandemic doesn't necessarily give us the exact roadmap to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, do any of the other speakers also have any, um, any, uh, you know, observations in this, in this regard? I mean, some people are up in uh, Canada, others in, uh, uh, you know, farther south. Um, Amanda, do you, do, do you have any, uh, any thoughts on this particular question from your viewpoint in, uh, in Newfoundland? Well, there was barely, I mean, the effects in Newfoundland have been minimal. I haven't seen really much maybe there was some trail expansion but it could have been because there was a new bridge built there i'm never really sure so very minimal but i think in canada there's been a very different response um i don't feel like it's been divisive um i feel like it's been cohesive and at least in my opinion um i do see the uh like what I see is the country saying, well, how can we emerge from this stronger and what can we learn? How can we think about sustainability? And, and that's certainly what our government is doing in terms of putting money into our um, federal programs and our science, our government science programs. So I find that positive. It doesn't mean the whole country is united on that wavelength, but it, it feels more positive to me. Um, yeah. Right. Um, uh, Teresa, you had um, showed some um, some maps uh, indicating the difference between different states in the in the U.S. in their uh, response. Well, in their use of um, of some of the uh, you know I naturalists and so forth. Um, what other kinds of observations have you made in terms of different locations, um, the way people have been responding to COVID um, uh, in different places in the U.S. You know, it was fun <laughs> to try to make sense of those maps when we first generated them and some of the patterns popped, you know, especially the east-west gradient, it was really, it didn't have a good reason for that. And especially the very spotty, you know, kind of inconsistent geographic patterns. 
We had to really dig into each program's nuances of participation and especially in you know the messaging that they undertook specific to this period and whether there were regional messages or activities that that were targeted that, that could potentially explain some of that um, some of the shifts that we saw um you know maybe one of the most interesting features that that emerged that i didn't really mention because we we didn't really we weren't able to validate or verify this much was that there does seem to be in some of the programs some of the east west stuff seems to kind of fall out along an urban rural break anyway you know if like western states especially the middle of the country where where um folks are just more dispersed anyways seems to have a different kind of response than folks that are states that are characterized more by by large cities um and in some of the, you know, some of the most, uh, what, what we saw there was really that um, it was the middle, middle of the country states were doing kind of the opposite of what we thought that the country would do overall, and definitely the opposite of what was going on in the more urbanized areas. Um, and so I think at one point somebody did say like, oh, does it does it at all match, <laughs> you know, the red versus blue states? And it it, it doesn't, you know, and I don't I don't think there's really that need of a story to be told. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, what it suggested to me was that there's, <laughs> there's a lot to be dug into and it was almost messier to have the data you know, explored by state because if you really wanna go deep, you've gotta look at 50 different states and we had four different programs and try to tell a story about all those different um, phenomena gets to be awfully long. <laughs> so really all we could do is kind of these broad brush, broad scale patterns and, and it kind of characterize the biggest patterns that we saw. Um, mm -hmm. so, and too, you know, I still think that there, it's a good story to tell about the March through May. And I was relieved to see Abe's graph showed and um, March through May was the biggest period, you know, where folks didn't go to parks. So I was like, okay, good, we got the, the window right. And it had been inspired by the graph that, that Amanda showed from the, one of the early papers in biological conservation as well. Um, but I also think that's a segment of the pandemic and that's the story that, that happened then, but that we might really see um, and be able to tell a richer story by looking at a, um, the subsequent months as well. And we're not done yet, so who knows what will happen. We may be looking at impacts in next March through May too and comparing it to 2020 and um yeah we won't know until we're until it's behind us I guess. Yeah um Abe um so you had pointed out some differences between um uh parks located distantly from urban areas and those located more you know closer uh would you say that the, that in in a way COVID is kind of underlining some of the in a way growing uh, uh, you know gulf between urban and and rural cultures at least in this country if not in if not in others uh, I don't I don't I don't know that it was necessary I think everybody no matter where they where they were were going outside there were just fewer of them near the rural parks than there were near the urban parks so, mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it was necessarily a a cultural gap in terms of who's using the parks. Um, actually, na national parks are kind of unusual for uh, among <laughs> in some things that they're very nonpartisan. They're very they're beloved by by most people. Our our budgets actually tend to be the Park Service budget tends to be higher under Republican administrations than it does under Democratic administrations. Um, what one thing that I wanted to mention too, though, about uh, that you know kind of building on something that Teresa was saying is, you know, it, a big question is, is how in the long run uh, people's behavior will change. Like, like to what degree are we gonna go back to behaviors that were pre-pandemic and to what degree are we gonna change over the long run? Are people gonna change habits? Um, and that isn't, isn't really clear. In the park service, like if you, if you compare this to like recessions, um, visitation in national parks tends to uh, build after recessions because a lot of times people are doing kind of near home vacations and national parks tend to be an option for that kind of thing. Um, 
And so we tend to see spikes after recessions and things like that. Um, and, and it, but it's, it's not at all clear that how people's behavior is gonna, gonna change. Um, is people's uh, dependence on parks gonna be maintained? Are people gonna really love being outside um, uh, for the long run? Or, and is that gonna lead to greater connections with natural areas and maybe prioritizing public parks as, as something uh, or, or, or not? Um, are we gonna keep consuming lots of plastic and take out? Hopefully not that. Um, but yeah, but I, but anyhow, that's a big open question and I don't know. We're trying to make a lot of uh, conclusions right now where our best data is from the peak of the pandemic, but definitely it's still playing out kind of in weird ways. Mm -hmm. So I just want to also mention that in the, uh, this one part near my house that I've been going to since I was about five years old, um, it was very striking during the height of the pandemic in, in, in April and May that um, not only with just more people there, but there were also families with small children there, which I'd never seen really very much in the park before. So families with small children, groups of teenagers without any parents. So groups of teenagers wandering around, groups of pre-teenage kids, um, and also different minority groups that I'd never seen in the woods. Um, so racial minorities that I'd just never seen walking around in the woods and they were out walking in the woods. And this was all a good thing. I mean, it was a good thing that all these groups that normally you would never see in the woods, they were out walking around. Um, but that's all actually declined quite dramatically over the last several months. So we're still at a higher level of visitation than, than was before the pandemic. But, but all these different diverse groups, I think, are, are much less represented right now. Oh, that's that's very interesting, and I and I think again shows that there's there's so much variability in the response to the, to this <clears throat> to this crisis, and uh, and I think um, all four of the speakers this evening really kind of um, brought out different aspects of this variability, and I think all of all of them and all of us will be continuing to uh, discover more and more new aspects of variability and um, new dimensions to the to the data um, as we move forward in the next few months and also of course we'll have a, a new political uh, system to deal with a little it's a slightly different different po political system to deal with and uh, we'll see what happens in terms of um, of the response to COVID and the management of the of the crisis so I just want to thank all of you very much for um, for your contributions very fascinating uh, really interesting. Um, I think we need to close now, but um, I, uh, I so much appreciate your your participation and also um, similarly to <clears throat> to the public and the participants and the audience and the people who left questions, unfortunately, not all of which we were able to get to. But uh, we'll have have to have another um, another session of similar sort um, and see what happens in the next uh, the next eight to twelve months. I'm sure there'll be a lot of changes. Thank you all very much. And thanks um, to the audience. We will see you um, again, hopefully, at the next uh, in, in, uh, iteration of the Dimensions of Sustainability Symposia, which will happen in the spring. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Reinhardt. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Best to everybody. Take care. <laughs>